So HPV, the human papillomavirus, is actually a very small virus that uh, is actually, there's actually many subtypes of it. There's actually over 100 subtypes. But about 40 of those subtypes tend to infect the genital region. And about 15 of those 40 subtypes are what we call high risk or oncogenic. And that means that they have the potential to develop into cancer. And what we've learned over the years is that cervical cancer in particular, so a cancer of the, of the part of the uterus at the very end of the uterus, is actually caused by HPV. So you get cervical cancer if you've had an HPV infection that hasn't gone away. It's actually transmitted through any sexual touching. If an individual has uh, HPV on part of their genital region, you can transmit it from sexual touching and also from sexual intercourse. HPV is actually a very uh, widely spread virus. Some scientists have done studies that have shown that probably up to 75% of women over the course of their lifetime will at some point have had an HPV infection. So this is not an infection that, in, that affects a very small group in the population. It affects a wide variety of women throughout their life, lifetime. Fortunately, because of all the work that we put into preventing cervical cancer through pap screening and through treatment of these precancerous lesions, only about 150 women uh, in the province develop cervical cancer every year. But I think it's important also to remember who these women are. These are, in large part, women between the ages of 20 and 49. So these are women who have a very central role in our communities and in our families. These are women who are mothers, their sisters, their wives, their daughters, their economic engines for their families, for their communities. They, they have a very large role. And so it's really important not to diminish the number of women who have cervical cancer. So one of the questions I get quite often is about uh, the safety of the HPV vaccine. So I think it's important to remember that in Canada, we have a very stringent and very well-established uh, product approval um, mechanism that's run through Health Canada. And Health Canada is an independent you know, arm's length procedure where they look very carefully at all the safety data, all the information that's available from the companies who've, who've trialed and developed the um, medication or therapeutic. And the HPV vaccine is no different. It's gone through that process and it's been approved by Health Canada. It was approved in July 2006. And I think it's important to remember is that this vaccine has been licensed in and approved in almost 100 countries now, so it is, it is widely used across the world. In the U.S. alone, there have been several million doses of this vaccine that have been given out, and certainly uh, there have been the side effects that have been reported are primarily local, so what that means is you, you girls will report um, pain, soreness, redness at the injection site. But in terms of serious adverse events, both in the clinical trials, when you compared young women who had a, a placebo and, and young women who received the vaccine, there was no difference in serious adverse events. And certainly when you look at the vaccine adverse event reporting from the states, and when you look at our Canadian data, there's been no, no, no data to date that has shown any serious adverse events that are a, a result of the HPV vaccine. I think it's also important, though, to just note that part of uh, product approval uh, processes are ongoing monitoring. So I th it's not that Health Canada approves this product and then washes their hands. They have ongoing uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation, and so they take their job very seriously, and I think it's important to remember that. I think when, you know, when one of the questions parents have is, well, why don't we wait 15 years? And I think one of, one of the things that's important to remember is we know now that we have a safe product that works, and it works in preventing precancerous lesions, the, the lesions that go on to develop into cervical cancer. So I think we need to be really clear about should we be waiting? Should we be waiting when we have a product that can offer this really important protection to young women? And I think that's why, uh, individuals and policymakers are really interested in offering this vaccine because it's a safe product that will offer young women prevention against uh, cervical cancer. This vaccine has actually been recommended and endorsed by really well-established uh, health bodies around the world. And that includes groups like the World Health Organization and the United Nations Fund for Population. It's also been 
recommended very strongly by important Canadian bodies, including the uh, Canadian Pediatric Society, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. So it's not just folks locally that are recommending. This is, these are national bodies and these are international bodies that have a strong track record in public health, a strong track record in vaccines, and a strong track re record in understanding what are key uh, interventions to, to protect people's health and to improve people's health. And these bodies have all uh, recommended this vaccine uh, very strongly. I think it's also important though as a parent uh, and as a, someone who spends a lot of time working in this field to understand uh, that there's a, a very strong body of evidence that supports the use of this vaccine and certainly as parents I know we're all cautious and want to do the best thing for our children and uh, one of the things I would say is that this vaccine represents a really important uh, preventive health opportunity for your daughter and in fact I think we're actually quite privileged in British Columbia to have access to this vaccine in a publicly funded program. One of the things we know about HPV is as we talk, we've talked about before that it's a virus that's very widely spread and there's been some recent studies that have shown there's a risk of acquisition of HPV even with one sexual partner. So it's really important for this vaccine because it's a preventive vaccine and what I mean by that is once you have an HPV infection, this vaccine doesn't work, doesn't help you to prevent, to get rid of it. So it helps to prevent you from acquiring any other HPV infections, but that HPV infection, if you have it, the vaccine is, is doesn't work. It's not going to get rid of it any faster. So for the vaccine to actually be useful, we have to give it to young women prior to sexual activity. And what we know when we look widely at British Columbia, that most young women before the age of 11 and 12 have not had sexual intercourse. So that's a good age to give it to them. As we go up into their teen years, increasing numbers of young women engage in sexual intercourse. So we don't want to wait until they've already been exposed and potentially not have the vaccine work for them. We want to give it to them well before, well before they've uh, been sexually active. So it actually has a chance to prevent them from getting HPV infection. One of the things we want to do is, is make it as easy as possible for young women to get this vaccine. And because we already have a very strongly established hepatitis B program going into the school, for instance, in grade six, it's a, it's a smart move to then add a vaccine to an existing program because the infrastructure is already there and we, know, we already know that that program works. In terms of grade nine program, we also have a vaccine program going in, so again, we could piggyback. But I think the other thing was, was we found that this would be a really good opportunity to maximize the number of girls in the province who would uh, get access to this vaccine. So if we did an, a three-year catch-up, so that is girls who are in grade nine this year, who are in grade eight this year when they reach grade nine, and who are in grade seven this year when they reach grade nine, they will all uh, get the vaccine. So what we're trying to do is maximize um, as many girls who would like to can have access to this vaccine. One of the other things that uh, we've learned about response to the HPV vaccine is actually as you get older, you get a lower, a less strong response to the vaccine. So when you looked and compared the vaccine that was given to young women and men between the ages of nine to 15 and compared them to the ages of, to young men and women the ages of 15 to 26, the response in the younger group was significantly higher, much, much higher. And what I mean by that is they had much higher antibody levels, uh, both after the first dose and after three doses, than uh, people who were between the ages of 15 and 26. So I think that's yet another reason to think about giving the vaccine earlier is that we actually know that individuals have a better response to the vaccine when it's given to them at a younger age group. So the vaccine has been studied in clinical trials. The, this one product has been studied in clinical trials that have included over 20,000 young women. And the median time for, for girls having been followed in that study was about three and a half, four years. But there's been a subset of that uh, study 
of young women who've been looked at for over five years. And what we show and what's been shown in that study is that the vaccine um, immune response continues to be very strong uh, five years out. And when they look at mathematical modeling and try to predict, well, where, how long will this protection last for? It lasts for, it's estimated certainly for at least 15 to 20 years, and it's, it's probably closer to lifelong. So uh, certainly it's important to note that uh, there have been, there's been data on young women for up to five years, and that's going to keep going. The Nordic countries have large registries as well as the, um, uh, as well as the industry studies, and they will be ongoing reporting of and monitoring um, the results of those clinical trials. I think it's really important to remember that the PAP screening is an important tool, but it's also a limited tool. We do know that about 30% of women who have developed cervical cancer in British Columbia actually went for PAP screening. The PAP in and of itself is a test when you do it just once is not a great test. It actually has some limitations. It's not as accurate as we would like it to be. And that's even when a practitioner does it absolutely correctly. And that's why, you, uh, as women know, you can't just get one pap screen. You have to go back again and again and again and again and again. And that's because of the limitations of the test. So again, I want to keep stressing that pap screening is really important. But we also need to also remember it's not the perfect test. So what happens is sometimes women get missed. So those precancerous lesions do get missed with pap screening. But I think the other important thing to remember about PAPs is all PAPs do is they identify precancerous lesions. They, they don't actually prevent them. So women have acquired an HPV infection. The cells in the cervix, the, the infection has not been cleared. Infection has become persistent. The cells in the cervix have then started on the journey towards precancerous lesions. And what the PAP does, it helps us identify those. So the vaccine works back here, where we prevent the actual infection. PAP screening, women have been allowed to get an HPV infection, uh, precancerous lesions have started to develop, and then PAP screening detects that. We know that this virus is the cause of cervical cancer, and we know that this vaccine will prevent about 70% of cervical cancers in the world, including in British Columbia. It's a preventive intervention. It prevents women from developing the precancerous lesions and requiring treatment and requiring removal of those precancerous lesions. We have an opportunity to prevent, and I think that's a really great thing. And just a couple of things about PAPS. Again, really important to remember that once young women have the vaccine, they're gonna still need PAP screening, because right now, as I mentioned, we're only going to be covering about 70% of the uh, of the cervical cancer. We're only going to be preventing about 70% of uh, cervical cancer with the vaccine. There are those other subtypes that are responsible for about 30% of cervical cancer, and they're not covered in the vaccine. So it's going to be important, even once women have received uh, the vaccine, that they go on to get Pap screening. And just a couple of things about Paps. Again, really important to remember that once young women have the vaccine, they're going to still need Pap screening because right now, as I mentioned, we're only going to be covering about 70% of the uh, of the cervical cancer. We're only going to be preventing about 70% of uh, cervical cancer with the vaccine. There are those other subtypes that are responsible for about 30% of cervical cancer, and they're not covered in the vaccine. So it's going to be important, even once women have received uh, the vaccine, that they go on to get Pap screening. So I think one of the questions that I get asked about is, is this a worthwhile use of our public dollars? And first of all, this is a preventive um, tool, and I think all of us. Uh, are interested in prevention as opposed to treatment and cures. We would rather be preventing disease than having to deal with the consequences of it. So I think that's first one of the first things I want to get out there is that I'm interested in this, and I think many f individuals are interested in seeing this being made available to young women because it's preventive. That said, uh, there have been several cost-effectiveness analyses done, not just internationally, but actually done in Canada. And even in our universal health care system with relatively inexpensive pap screening and colposcopy and relatively inexpensive cancer treatments, 
when you look at uh, the HPV vaccine and compare it, say, to other new vaccines or other, um, other health interventions, it's actually a very cost-effective and very reasonable uh, health intervention. So not only is it a preventive product, but it's actually a, a cost-effective um, intervention as well. BC has uh, been fortunate because we have uh, some large, committed uh, provincial uh, agencies that have been interested in HPV. That includes the BC Cancer Agency, BC Center for Disease Control, BC Women's Hospital, uh, the Vaccine Evaluation Center of the BC Children's Hospital. We've been working together actually now for several years to think about what BC needed to do to get ready for the HPV vaccine. And we've been fortunate because we've worked collaboratively as a team to look at the existing international data, but also to actually gather and generate our own BC specific data to help us make decisions. And this went all the way from uh, studies looking at um, cost effectiveness and mathematical modeling, looking at what the impacts of the HPV vaccine would be in terms of, uh, in terms of British Columbia. We've looked at parental attitudes. We've looked at uh, what factors influence the planned uptake of uh, the vaccine. We've looked at sexual practices of young people. So we've really worked hard to have data that is relevant to BC to help guide our decisions. One of the things that parents worry about is whether use of this vaccine, uh, use of a vaccine to prevent a uh, sexually acquired infection will actually promote sexual behavior in young women. I think one important piece of information to remember is that there's now increasing evidence that shows that to discuss sexual health matters with your, your youth does not in any way increase uh, sexual activity. So in some ways, the HPV vaccine is, is just another tool in terms of discussing sexual health practices with, with young people and with youth. And there's no data that shows that uh, when you discuss sexual health issues with youth, that they're more likely to engage in uh, um, sex. In fact, what it shows is if they, are, if they are educated, they're more likely to practice safe sex, and they're not any more likely to engage in sex at any earlier activity. British Columbia has had for several years now uh, a hepatitis B vaccine program. And hepatitis B is a sexually acquired infection, and that program is actually done through grade six, which is the same group that we'll be giving the HPV vaccine to. And we're fortunate in British Columbia to have a group called McCreary Society that does very comprehensive adolescent health surveys and tracks a number of things about youth health. One of the things they do look at is youth sexual health, among the, the many other things that they look at. And they've been tracking uh, sexual health behaviors over the past uh, 15 years in British Columbia. And during the time period of having the hepatitis B vaccine, uh, not only have we not seen a change or, or an increase in uh, the number of sexual partners or a lowering of the age of first uh, sexual intercourse, but we've actually seen a rise in the age of first sexual intercourse and an increase in safer sex practices in youth. So it's in fact uh, contrary to what I think some parents are worried about, which is that they're worried that the HPV vaccine will increase uh, sexual risk taking and increase, uh, uh, increase number of sexual partners and maybe make young people more likely to engage in sex at a younger age. And in fact, our experience with the hepatitis B vaccine and our experience looking at our uh, youth data show quite the contrary. One of the best ways to determine uh, safety of a vaccine is actually to look at a randomized trial where one group of women receive a vaccine and the other group receive a placebo or uh, don't receive the vaccine. And then you follow those women through and determine if there's side effects or adverse events compared between those, those groups. And this was done for the HPV vaccine. There were over 20,000 women uh, included in the trial. And when, when you compared women who received the vaccine and women who didn't receive the vaccine, there was no difference in severe adverse events or in serious adverse events between the two groups. And that's one of the most helpful indicators and the most helpful ways to determine if there are serious side effects that are associated with the vaccine. And certainly the clinical trials have not found that. And I think what's also important to note is that these clinical trials are going to have ongoing monitoring. So uh, beyond the five-year mark, it will, these, uh, these trial participants will continue to be followed. And so we can have a sense of if there are any uh, adverse events to be unmasked. But 
to date, there have been no, there's absolutely no difference between uh, the two groups. There's a very stringent approval process. Vaccine was licensed almost now two years ago. That's licensed throughout the world. Millions of doses have several millions of doses been given in the U.S. alone and around the world. And uh, again, no no adverse events have been have been thought to be caused by the um, by the vaccine. And each adverse event, is, you have to remember, is carefully looked at. And they look at risk factors. They look at all the events that surround it. And they go through each of those cases uh, one by one. And, and none of them have uh, been caused by the, the vaccine.